Hi, this is Kelsey Fogoski for AP Gov Review. And in Unit 2, Part 5, we're going to be looking at voting. And in Unit 3, there is an entire chapter that's focused just on elections. However, since this is the political beliefs unit, voting is part of that. So we will be getting a brief introduction to that. So let's first start off with a vocabulary term. Certainly, you've hopefully you've heard of it from U.S. history, that being suffrage. And that, of course, just means the legal right to vote. It has nothing to do with suffering. It just entails your right to vote. And really, we see suffrage being most extended, specifically to the African Americans, as a result of the 15th Amendment. During the age of Reconstruction, right after the Civil War, white Southerners tried to restrict African Americans' ability to vote by imposing things such as poll taxes, that you would actually have to pay taxes to vote. You'd actually have to pay some money. Um, so with the little money that they had from sharecropping or tenant farming, really you weren't going to spend it on voting. In addition, literacy tests, you'd actually have to show that you could read and write. Well, if you were just a freed slave, you probably did not possess that ability as opposed to a white person. And then you also had grandfather clauses, which essentially said if your grandfather had voted in prior elections, you did not have to necessarily pass a literacy test. So this grandfathered uh, white Southerners in specifically. So when the 15th Amendment is passed, this is you know trying to give African Americans the right to vote. However, Southerners are thinking ahead and trying to think of ways to restrict voting activity, especially from freed African Americans, and that's why you have poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfathers clauses. We'll get back to that at a later date. In addition, um, when we look at suffrage, it was significantly extended to 50% of the population as a result of the 19th Amendment, which came about in 1920. And then fast forward right around the Vietnam era, and you had the passage of the 26th Amendment. How this amendment came about was that 18-year-olds were fighting in wars, specifically in Vietnam, and at this point, they were not allowed to vote. And the argument came about that, hey, you can kill somebody in war, but you're not old enough to vote, and as a result, pressure upon the legislatures uh, led to the 26th Amendment. And one other piece of legisl legislation that's going to uh, increase suffrage is the Voting Rights Act, which is going to specifically outlaw literacy tests. Remember, these were designed to prevent African Americans from voting, at least in large chunks. As a result of all of this, you're going to see increase in suffrage. Definitely be aware of the suffrage amendments from the 15th, 19th, and 26th. I'm sure you'll see some type of question, whether that be an FRQ or a multiple choice question. Now, when you look at voting specifically, the United States has one of the lowest voting turnouts, especially when you look at congressional elections, but that's certainly for another time. Now, one person uh, with the name Downs basically stated that it is rational really not to vote, that if you don't really see clear differences between parties, you're not going to vote. And this indifference, it makes it seem that rationally you would abstain from voting. There are some people out there that say Democrats and Republicans, they're, they're really the same types of people or they both stink. And as a result, they're not going to, to vote. Now, among some of the reasons for this decline include voter fraud. We're talking specifically in the 19th century. Um, we also see stricter voting registration procedures, especially in the South, especially now that uh, some states are requiring photo identification. And then on top of that, when you really compare the United States to Europe, really registration is done in very different ways. In Europe, a lot of countries have same-day registration or it's automatically done, whereas in the United States, it's the onus is on the individual to sign up. Now, specifically in the United States, the political efficacy in which you believe that your vote actually really matters and is really going to influence an election is relatively low when you compare it to European nations. And mathematically speaking, probably won't make a difference. However, keep in mind that only two-thirds of the voting age in the United States are actually registered to vote. That's 33% of people who are not registered to vote. Along with political efficacy, uh, ballot fatigue is another contributor as to the low turnout, where people only vote for a couple of races, especially during an election year for a president. You will have congressional elections, you will, you know, dealing with the House of Representatives and Senate. You'll also have statewide elections. You'll, you may also have local elections. 
and people see this form where they might have to actually vote in about 15 races and they only vote for a couple of that and they basically skip the rest of the of the ballot and yes again this is a real thing where people are literally tired out by this overwhelming ballot where there might be 15 16 even more races uh, depending on the election year now other people are going to vote you know regularly um, as a result of seeing that it is their civic duty the belief that in order to support democratic government a citizen should always vote so that this was a right that was fought for and you know founding fathers really embedded into the constitution and thus it is one's responsibility in a democratic society to vote on a regular basis so that's why some people vote but also you have a number of reasons as to why people don't vote now when we look at reported turnout rates Amongst 18 to 20 year olds, a mere 29% actually vote, but notice the steady increase as one gets older, your likelihood to vote is going to dramatically increase because you might be more invested in the election, you might see a greater impact on the election, specifically with taxes, whereas when you're 18 to 20, you might be in college and you may not really see how politics is going to affect you, whether it's going to be socially or economically. Now, when we look at level of education, same thing is true here. As you gain more education, the more likely you are to vote. 72% of people with a bachelor's degree or higher are going to vote in elections compared to a mere 31% when you don't even have a high school diploma. In terms of race, whites are most likely to vote and Hispanics uh, just a little bit before African Americans and Asians. Uh, women, interestingly enough, are more likely to vote than men just by a small margin. Married people are also more likely to vote compared to single people. And unions, which are very political, act, politically active, are also much more likely to vote as opposed to non-union members, as of course unions tend to be tied to politics and political activity. Now, when you look at the decline of turnout, I mean, notice at one point around 1896, you had about 80% of uh, eligible adults voting in the election. Now notice how that has significantly decreased over time, even dropping quite dramatically in around 1924. And really it has not really recovered um, beyond about 50 to 55 to 60 percent, even when you do extend this into 2008, 2012. Um, so again, the United States does have an issue with turnout. Now one thing that has been used to combat this low turnout rate is with encouraging voting registration. Now, voting registration is going to vary by state. Uh, two thirds, as I mentioned earlier, of the voting age are registered, but that leaves a third that are not voting, uh, which is very, very, um, very high uh, for a modern world uh, nation. Now, things such as how attached you are to your political party um, or automatic registration when you're 18, like European nations have, other nations have compulsory uh, voting laws, um, you're going to see higher rates, obviously. Now, one thing that the United States has done specifically is the Motor Voter Act, uh, otherwise known as the National Registration Act of 1993, which requires states to permit people to register the vote when they are applying for their driver's licenses. So when you're uh, turning 17 um, and you are going to get your license, you can already pre-register to vote from when you become 18. Now, this created an initial surge of voters. However, just because you're registered to the vote doesn't necessarily mean you're going to vote. So as a result, this has had mixed results, hasn't really increased voting turnout all that much. It's only just increased the number of people who are registered. Now, there are some states that do have election day, uh, same day election day registration. Um, they're going to have higher turnout, obviously, as opposed to other states, like, for example, New Jersey requires you to register before the election. And if you don't register uh, before the election, you cannot vote that specific day. So, again, it really depends on the state. So, as we mentioned earlier, the more education you have, the more likely you to vote. The more attachment you have to a political party, you are more likely to vote as opposed to independence. Older you are, more likely to vote. You can also think... To some extent, you have more, to, more free time, especially since older people tend to be retired. Race, again, Caucasians more likely to vote, but other ethnicities uh, with a comparable education are actually higher than whites. And then, as we mentioned earlier, females are more likely to vote. Marital status, union, 
certainly going to increase that. Um, and so the more of these traits that you have, the more likely you are to vote. So if you're educated, uh, you're female, you're in, you're in union, you're really very, very much uh, likely to vote in an election. Now, some facilitators and obstacles to participation. Well, if you have voter registration, that, of course, is going to be an obstacle to participation, as opposed to states that have same-day registration, they're going to have higher turnout rates. Uh, a new sort of recent phenomenon has been voter identification laws, which requires you to possess a photo ID in order to vote. And this has been a claim by Democrats that this is a way for specifically Southern or Republican states to thwart minority voting. You can follow a link where there's a daily uh, show uh, by John Stewart to clip here um, about that should you wish to check it out. Also apathy. Some people just don't care about elections. They don't care about politics. They don't think it affects them. And as a result, they're not going to participate. Certainly another facilitator is going to be the extension of suffrage as a result of things such as the 15th, 19th, 26th Amendment. These are things that are going to enable people to participate. But certainly one obstacle is the ineffectiveness of political parties at times, especially when you see um, you know, how divisive elections can be and the major differences between the two political parties. This can turn people off to politics. Now, what is interesting is analyzing the reasons why people don't vote. Did you know that on sunnier days, turnout is actually higher as opposed to when it's raining? Um, but the number one reason why people don't vote is they say they're too busy, or there's an illness or emergency, or they don't like the candidates, or registration problems, or they forgot somehow. Um, so these are major reasons as to why people don't vote. There's always an excuse. What about the fact that it's on a Tuesday? Why not on a weekend? Nevertheless. So once Americans vote in explaining a citizen's decision, there's one thing called the mandate theory of elections, the idea that the winning candidate has a mandate from the people to carry out his or her platform. So if a person wins, they're saying, hey, they're voting for me because on my policy to expand health care. So politicians see this as a mandate from the voters to carry out his or her policies or platform promise to the voters. Politicians like this theory, of course, better than uh, political science uh, political scientists do. So certainly uh, when we look at changing voting uh, patterns and, and specifically behavior, you'll notice a little bit of a shift here. For example, um, when you look at uh, women, you had more women voting for Republican Nixon uh, than you did for Democratic Kennedy. Now that has changed when you look at the Obama-McCain election. Uh, when you look at 18 to 29 year olds, still Democratic, but look at the expansion of that from Kennedy's era to the Obama era. So certainly you have seen a shift. So ultimately, how Americans see the candidates, candidates want to have a good visual image. This is where making media appearances, whether it's on late night comedy or on the daily uh television shows and news outlets, that's very important. Personality plays a major role, especially you want to come off as honest. You don't want to come off as incompetent, and these go a very, very long way. Now, what is interesting is that many people do not necessarily base their vote on policy voting, basically where the candidates stand on an issue. But it can occur when voters do know when there are differences between the candidates, but we don't see policy voting happening that much because the media tends to focus on the horse race of the election as opposed to the specific issues. So that's important because candidates not don't always take a specific uh, stand and this can leave voters in the dark. Now, in terms of the greater the policy differences, you're gonna see uh, the more likely that voters will be able to steer government policy by their choices, but again, since uh, it can be difficult to hold a candidate's feet to the fire and get a specific answer, this does not always happen. Now, sometimes people vote in what's called retrospective voting here, in which you base your vote on what a candidate has done for them lately, specifically in incumbents. So if they feel that they're worse off based on how they were with incumbents or there's a bad economy, then they may become a retrospective voter and say, you know what, this person did not help at all. Okay, final slide here. So elections generally support government uh, policies and power. Voters tend to feel that they're sending a message, especially if they're going to be voting out an incumbent, and thus the government expands to fill the needs of the voter. So 
You see that a lot. So this is going to end Unit 2, Political Beliefs and Behavior.